Now, welcome also all our audience to SPS Monk Training Center here in Taiping. And I'm very glad for being given this wonderful opportunity to be, to be part of this very meaningful e-learning series of talks about the various aspects of the meaning of Sangha. And where my particular topic for today is monastic ordination and training. And this happens to be a topic I personally feel very passionate about. So I'm glad, I'm glad I was not asked to talk about quantum physics or how to repair cars, both of which I know nothing about. <laughs> but since we monks don't drive cars, I guess that's okay. So I would like to start out by first talking for a few minutes about the ordination procedure itself. And then afterwards, we'll spend most of the time talking about the value and importance also of monastic training, huh? uh, which is also probably the most interesting and relevant part of my presentation today. However, there would be no monastics if there were not first a proper ordination ceremony. Mm. And like so many other aspects of the veneer, the procedures for ordination and the patterns that are followed in accepting applicants into the Sangha, into the community, uh, they were not determined all at once, but they grew in response to events over time. And uh, I'm reading here out a small summary from a very good Winner manual, a manual that was written by a Western monk, by Ajahn Tanisaro. Uh, it's called the Buddhist Monastic Code, where he gives also an introduction uh, about uh, the uh, procedure of ordination of proper monk or monastic ordination. And he also explains that there were actually three main stages in the development of monastic ordination. The first stage, during the very early years of the Buddha's teaching career, at that time, when an applicant asked to join the Sangha, the Buddha would simply say, Ehi bhikkhu, come bhikkhu. Ehi means come, come monk. <laughs> that was the monk's ordination. So that was, was the acceptance into the community already. Just this, so simple, huh? But then as the community grew, then the Buddha also sent his monks and disciples in separate ways to spread the teaching. And when they had inspired others, also a desire to join the Sangha uh, arose in them. And at the beginning stages, the monks then bring all those potential ordination candidates back to the Buddha for him to give them the ordination. But then also that was not always easy because you can imagine the roads were often at a very poor condition, are very muddy, and so sometimes they had to travel far distances on foot. So eventually then the Buddha also allowed individual disciples to accept applicants on their own. So a monk could then ordain another person to become a monk. And that was done with the three refuge formula. I think most of us here are familiar with that. Buddhang saranang gachami, Dhammang saranang gachami, Sanghang saranang gachami, and then to Tiampi and Tatiampi. To the Buddha I go for refuge, to the Dhamma I go for refuge, to the Sangha I go for refuge. And this was repeated three times, and that's it. That was the ordination procedure in the second step. Huh? So at the first, Buddha just said, come Bhikkhu. Now the monks can also ordain others with the three refuge formula. And then a third stage came about when the Buddha saw that the Sangha grew and required more and more formal organization. Then he rescinded and put aside the going for a refuge in the Triple Gem as a means of acceptance. And instead, he replaced it with a formal community transaction, a Sangha Kama, where there's a motion and three proclamations. 
So this is, I know, very technical, uh, but also to give you a bit of a historical background of these stages, how monk ordination came to be. Uh, so first stage, the Buddha says, come monk, that's it. Second stage, uh, you can go to any monk, he can ordain you uh, by undertaking the three refuges. Third stage, you need a whole sangha, a community, to ordain a person. So it become more formalized and more standardized at that time. Actually, we can say that ordination itself, it falls into two parts, you see. The first one is called Papaja, the going forth, where you go forth from home to homelessness. You shave off your head, uh, put on the ochre robes, this is called the going forth. It's the first part. And the second part is called Upasambada, acceptance. But the Sangha, the community of monks or nuns, where they accept a new member into their community. So, and they're going forth and leave their home life uh, for homelessness, for homelessness, uh, becoming thereby uh, one who has come forth. Sometimes, if somebody is young, uh, we also call it a samanera, a novice. Then after one's head is shaven and one puts on the ochre robes, takes refuge in the triple gem and also undertakes the ten precepts. So this is the first stage. And then, uh, with acceptance in the Sangha afterwards, one becomes a fully-fledged bhikkhu. First, uh, you're just somebody who has come forth, but not yet they can higher ordination or full ordination. So the second step is also important. But the Sangha welcomes the person and thereby becoming a fully-fledged bhikkhu. Is that also you have full rights to live in common affiliation with the rest of the Sangha. So it's interesting, you know, actually the going forth, the first stage is not a community transaction. You just need one monk and you can become a novice very easily. But for higher ordination, for acceptance, the agreement of the entire Sangha is required. And you know, if there's just one member in the Sangha who maybe doesn't like your face, <laughs> well, hopefully it's not like that, but theoretically, even a single monk can object to a candidate's ordination and he would not be able to, go to become a monk. So the entire community has to welcome and accept the person. It's like a family. So we become part of the larger family of the Sangha. Then there are actually also some other requirements, like age requirements. Yeah. For example, a person who wants to become a novice should be at least 15 years old, 15, or if not yet, then at least capable of chasing away the crowds. <laughs> this was in ancient India, the way how they would determine whether somebody is kind of uh, mature enough to do simple tasks, or to look after himself, or to, uh, to, in this case, chasing away the crowds was kind of the yardstick by which to measure uh, the maturity of a person. So even so, a person might be just eight or 10 years old, Theoretically, he could be admitted to the Sangha even at such an early age. Yeah. So, for that, uh, it's the minimum age is very young, but then to become a fully fledged monk, one must be at least 20 years old. Yeah. 20 years. So, if that is fulfilled, theoretically, everybody can, be, can ordain. However, there are also some factors that could be disqualifications. Mm -hmm. There actually is a long list of factors that are mentioned in our Vinaya texts. And some of them may be more relevant, some are less nowadays. But uh, maybe I give you a small overview of things that must not be the case if you want to become a monk or not. For example, if a person has killed one's mother or father, uh, such a person cannot ordain. Or maybe a person who, maybe on the previous occasion, uh, just put on the rope on his own and then goes to the market to collect food. Uh, 
uh, like a fake monk you know, for the sake of money or status and support. You know, maybe then he's going to Penang in the morning, he's going arms round very mindfully, uh, collecting food, standing in front of the nice laksa store. <laughs> and then as soon as he's got his food, he goes back home, changes back to trousers and blue jeans. You know. So somebody who has done something like that in the past can never ordain in this whole life. It's called having taken affiliation by theft because he pretends to be a monk. Really, he's not uh, such a person who is never allowed to ordain again. Or a person who doesn't have parents' permission. You know? Actually, regardless of how old you are, even you might be already 50, 60 years old, if parents are still alive, you still need to ask them for permission. And if they agree, very good. But if they don't agree, actually, also you cannot become a monk. And it's actually quite an important factor, I think, so that especially the close family, typically parents, uh, because if they are not okay with it, you know, they don't want to, want to let the boy go, uh, then uh, later on there will be a lot of difficulties. So it is important to get their formal agreement. They might like it, or maybe not so much, but as long as they agree, that's good enough. It's also a form of respect, you know. Okay, they've been looking after us for so many years, so we also value their opinion. And if we do something really important, it's good to consult them first. As I said earlier, the Buddha's time, there were even really young boys or girls becoming Sangha members, becoming novices. So also it's quite important that the parents would agree to that. And nowadays, for example, in Burma, there are even some monasteries where, where there are orphans. They, they have no more parents for whatever reason. And then often they become also uh, novices in very young age, sometimes eight years, ten, something like that. Yeah. And then the rest of the community looks after the novice, gives him some education, and trains him in spiritual qualities. Mm. So one needs one's parents' permission. Another factor, for example, a person who cannot ordain if he has debts alone, credit at a bank or at a private person, again, that would have to be settled first. Then he can ordain, but as long as a person has still debts or a loan, uh, he either pays it back or has to find somebody else who takes it over on his behalf. So if the creditor says, the creditor, yeah, the creditor says, okay, we don't need to pay it back, that's also okay. The reason is also, you know, because at the Buddha's time, the Sangha had a lot of support at a certain stage. And some people were just trying to escape from having to pay back their loans so that they ordain and then nobody can ask them anymore to give them money because now they're monks, then uh, people would let them get away with it. But this is not a good incentive, a good purpose for becoming a monk or nun, right? So in order to prevent that, you have to first pay back your credit, your loan, and then you can ordain. Another reason why a person might not be able to ordain could be a very serious disease, uh, something like leprosy, or boils, or tuberculosis, epilepsy. And some have questioned actually whether this is really compassionate to the person with the disease. But then from the origin story, we also understand that this rule was formulated for the sake of protection. Uh, basically of both of the Sangha itself, but also of the lay supporters who would otherwise be burdened with the uh, sick person's care. So again, it shouldn't be an incentive or oh, a person is very sick, maybe doesn't have support from the family or doesn't have enough money. And therefore, just for this reason, wants to become a monk. So again, it's not the right re reason. If you want to strive for Nibbana, practice the Dhamma, develop the mind, these are the correct reasons, not as a way of healthcare. But once a person is in the Sangha, 
Oh yes, then we do take care for each other. Uh, both we look after each other when a person gets sick, uh, as well as uh, can be a need for material support. Um, and then also often the lay community will also try to help the sick monk. And lastly, but also quite important, uh, you would need to have a set of ropes to wear and an arms, arms bore. Otherwise, also cannot become a monk. But I guess that's pretty easy to accomplish. So once these things are accomplished and fulfilled, and none of the disqualifications, and then the person can request the going forth. So, as I said, the going forth consists of the taking of the three refuges only, and the ten precepts, which is given by the preceptor, by the teacher. But then the high ordination requires a quorum, a quorum of monks. At least, at a bare minimum, you need five monks to be present and who have to agree and approve of the ordination of the candidate. Hmm. And as I said earlier, any monk can block the, his ordination at that time. And also it's interesting, at most three people can be ordained at a time. So we cannot ordain 50 people in one go. You can do three, and then an hour later you can ordain another three, but you have to take each one as an individual, investigate, you see, does he has, have any of those reasons for, for disqualification? Maybe he has debts or um, some kind of very serious physical diseases. So we have to deal each one with an individual, therefore there's a maximum of three monks can be ordained at once. And for nuns, it's actually just one, one nun at a time. And if one were to ordain more than three monks at once, or more than one nun at once, that would actually invalidate the kama. It would not be a legally valid ordination. So actually, the person would still be a lay person. Even if he or she wears robes, uh, it would still not be a valid ordination. Hmm. And then out of these five uh, monks who are joining that ordination, at least, it can be 10, 20, 30, but out of them, one of them has to be a Vinaya expert who knows the monk's rules very well. And he's the one who will also act as the newly ordained person's preceptor, as his upachaya. And the preceptor also has a number of qualifications to fulfill, and most importantly, he has to be at least 10 vasa, 10 years as a monk. Cannot also be uh, just two vasa monk. Yeah, probably he would need training on his own. So he should be an incompetent and experienced monk. And the Buddha actually also outlined a bit the relationship between the teacher and his disciple. It's actually a very beautiful relationship. Uh, reminds me a little bit on how in a family uh, one would look after each other, after each other. The Buddha says, "Pikus, I, I allow a preceptor, and the preceptor will foster the attitude he would have towards a son. So he has the perception of a son when dealing with his disciple, and the student will foster the attitude he would have toward a father, with regard to his teacher. Thus." They, living with mutual respect, deference, and courtesy, will arrive at growth, increase, and maturity in this Dhamma and Venere. Very beautiful. From Mahavaga 1, 25.6. Especially for the first five years of a monk, uh, one is supposed to stay close with a teacher, and in this way, Learn, learn the ropes, quite literally, uh, but also learn the basics of monk life. The monk rules, about meditation, the Dhamma practice, Dhamma discussion. And so this is what the first five years, monk should not be alone or living alone in a cave. Uh, no, you have to be with a teacher actually for the first five years. But then afterwards, uh, you could seek out more secluded places. 
Yeah. So this is also the Buddha's way of achieving quality control. <laughs> because otherwise the monks just randomly go about, don't even know how to wear their robes, many things. In fact, monk training and giving guidance is one of the most important things uh, for monastics. It's not just enough to ordain him and then let him do his own thing, uh, but monk training is actually a very important factor for also having good monks, proper monks, who can be inspiring and also good in their own practice and striving towards Nibbana. About the importance of monastic training and how this is done here in SBS Monk Training Center, I actually gave a talk on this topic last year. The talk had a uh, somewhat controversial title, Are Monastics Protecting or Corrupting the Sasana? So if you're interested in it, you can look it up on YouTube at a later occasion. Uh, are Monastics Protecting or Corrupting the Sasana? I will not give you the answer for that now, but uh, I've compiled some passages from the talk because I've also mentioned it, mentioned something about monk training there. So I've prepared a clip that we can now uh, watch together. And then afterwards, I would like also to invite you for questions, comments, where we can have a bit of a cool and a session afterwards. Okay? How can we achieve that? How can we help monastics? What can monastics do in order to fulfill their potential? And this is where monk training comes in. I always say, ordination alone is not enough. You know, you just change from blue jeans to robes. Yeah, outwardly speaking, you become a monastic. But if you still act and think and interact in the same way as before, uh, not much difference to that state of earlier. So ordination itself does not make you a contributor for the longevity of the sasana. You often need a supportive community, both monastic community, but also laity who work together to bring out the best in each and every one. So just like top sports people or musicians or even elite soldiers, they train in a team. They train often as a small group to middle-sized group and they train together and they polish their skills. They sometimes we call hot beds. Sometimes you find why is this tennis club bringing up top ranked tennis players year after year? What is different from that place to these others? Huh? So they have a certain way of practice, a certain way of training. They don't just give you a tennis racket and say, okay, now you just play. No, there will be a teacher, a trainer, and other people who are working together with whom you can practice. Huh? So this is where monk training comes in. Ordination alone is not sufficient. And that's why we have here in the Bing SPS Monk Training Center. Huh? And according to our uh, constitution and vision and mission statement, it says there that SPS Monk Training Center is a sanctuary for Buddhist monks to deepen their knowledge, understanding and practice of the Buddha's teachings. So it's not only for monks who are already monks, but it's also a place where as a lay practitioner you can come and find out whether monastic life could be suitable for you. You don't have to have decided already beforehand. And to live up to this uh, aspiration for well-trained monastics, uh, we provide training courses, you know, where either monks who have ordained here can join, or even monks who come from other monasteries on a later time during their monastic life. This could be after five years, 10 years, or even more than 20 years, and who voluntarily would like to sign up for some of the courses that we provide. So what are the kind of practices that are kind of cornerstones of SPS Monk Training Center? 
I would like to share a little bit with you. The first one, very important one, meditation. Meditation both in theory, but also practice, of course. So this also includes experimenting and gaining a certain level of proficiency with different meditation techniques, different methods, and then to apply them skillfully in whatever situation uh, and purpose we need it. Even so, uh, I would recommend having one Mula Kamadana, one main meditation object. But there are times in your life where you need to counter certain hindrances, certain difficulties, and you can use certain meditation methods that can help you at that time. So it is helpful to have a small toolbox, meditation tools that you can apply to different situations or different times of the day. Just like a skilled cook uh, does not only cook many, many things, but he also observes what the king or whom, for whomever he cooks, uh, whatever the person takes, and then provides those things that the person likes and takes and consumes. Likewise, we should know the signs of our mind and know, ah, now is the time when my mind needs to be tranquilized. Oh, maybe very restless. So it's a time to rest, uh, to, to tranquilize, to calm the mind. But sometimes the mind is quite calm already. It's actually a time where you might almost fall asleep, in meditation especially. Then this could be a time where you might need a meditation method that can energize the mind, give you a sense of joy and beauty, sukha. So not always necessarily the same method uh, will bring the desired results. So that's why uh, I said earlier a little bit like different tools for different situations. So learning about meditation, uh, both in theory, what can I do when this happens, what can I do when that happens, but then also of course in practice. That's a very central element of what we do here. Then also um, Tamil knowledge very important that we also know the Buddha's teachings because that provides the framework and the right perspective, the right attitude about the practice. Not just about the practice, also the right attitude towards the scriptures themselves is also important. To be able to distinguish you know, uh, what comes from the Buddha, what comes from eminent monks, from eminent scholars or other practitioners, and there uh, can be a different value that we attribute to these different layers of authority or layers of information. Some are earlier, some are later. How do we uh, deal when there are differences in different scriptures? To which one to give priority? So these are all things that uh, the Buddha actually laid down already systems for that. And that we often do in our sutta readings and vinaya classes, where we evaluate also not only the content, but also the reliability of different sources. The same about vinaya, you know, the monk's rules. I just have to say, uh, even so, here in, in our conversation, I always speak about monks, because SPS is a monk training center, but that does not mean that these principles cannot also be applied to nuns and female monastics. Huh? So, linear knowledge are very important also. Knowing once the regulations by which we abide, and then also a healthy attitude about the linear that can be fueled by trust in the Buddha, in his wisdom, and also being able to see that sometimes the letter of a rule could be different from the spirit. And then how to deal with that, with that tension a little bit. Because sometimes when you just go after the letter of a rule, you might technically speaking not commit any offense. There are ways around how you can avoid committing certain offenses. But then uh, the spirit of the rule is still not fulfilled because you just, it's like a little bit this loophole 
way a lot like a lawyer might think to avoid certain falling into certain breaking the, the law uh, in certain areas. So it's important not only to follow the letter, but also take the spirit behind the rules into account, know the origin stories. And then it helps not only the monk or nun to understand the reason for the veneer rules, but also when people ask us, oh, why are you doing like this? Why are you walking barefoot when you go to the village? Well, why do we have to offer the food all the time? Why can you not just put it on the table? If you have no answer for these kind of questions, people will also scratch their heads and say, oh, very strange, you know, <laughs> very strange preferences, these monks and nuns. But once the monk knows and can explain, and often we didn't understand, oh, there's actually good reasons for these things. Uh, why do we have to get the food offered into our hands? Why can you not just put it on the table over there? In fact, you can offer things to a monastic by putting it on the table or anywhere and just say, oh, one day, uh, this umbrella, uh, I would like to offer it to you, uh, it's yours. He says, he say, sadhu, sadhu, and then that's it. You don't have to offer it into his hands. But why is it then different with food or medicine? Well, suppose there's a misunderstanding. <laughs> Maybe I thought you were offering this umbrella to me, but actually you were just parking it there for yourself for later. But now I've taken it. Then tomorrow you come and say, oh, where's my umbrella? But then, since I have it, I can say, oh, sorry, I thought it's for me. Then you can return it, right? But with food, how am I going to return the food after I've eaten it? I mean, we could try, but you might not want it. <laughs> so that's why for food and medicine, the guideline is a bit stricter in that it has to be really, really 100% clear this is really meant for this monastic. And by saying, yeah, you give it into his hand or something connected with his hand, like a bowl, is a very sure way to make sure it's really just for him. There can be no misunderstanding. So once we understand the reason behind a veneer rule, it's actually quite intuitive and makes sense often. So that's a, another important aspect of monk training, especially here in SPS. Learning not only about the veneer, but also the attitude uh, uh, related to the veneer. Also, uh, a certain degree of skill in practical things is helpful. Here in SBS, even before ordination, the candidates have to make their own robes. Uh, we don't give them ready-made robes, uh, even though we could we have spare robes, but I want them to learn how to sew the robes, how, be, how to be able to make them on their own. And nowadays we can use sewing machines, but even though working with a sewing machine, uh, still requires practice. And for most of us, <laughs> at least for myself, when I was growing up, I did not learn how to handle a sewing machine. So it takes a bit of practice, but it's a very useful skill actually. And then later on, wherever the monk is, he can repair his own, his own clothes, you know. Sometimes you go through a forest, through a jungle, and then some thorns sticking out and you hang with the rope there. Very easy, this cloth, you know, is flapping. You have to get hung somewhere, and then you have a hole in it. And then the person, the monk knows how to put a patch on it, how to repair it. You know. So it's a very useful skill. Don't always depend on others so much. Or even with brooms, you know, we make our own brooms. You know, just get the liddy, so you call liddy here in Malaysia, no? get the, the broomsticks, uh, get the bamboo stick and then put them together with a string usually. And that again takes a bit of practice, but you can make much better brooms than what you can buy in the shop. <laughs> I was so surprised actually. First time they got, got us some, some brooms from a shop locally here. The, there was a broomstick and there was this blue cover, a blue plastic cover. 
and then the the bristles, the lady inside, inside that blue plastic cover. And then I used it two times, or I think almost the first time, after a few sweeps, or half the broomsticks are already, the lady are already falling out. So how can this person make a business with such brooms? So we went back and made our own brooms again. And it's an important skill uh, to, to have, especially for forest monks. Uh, it's part of our training and of our practice. Also, how to live out in the open, you know? How to survive in, in a forest or under a tree? How do you protect yourself from snakes or scorpions? So these are all, all things that most of us, since they have grown up in cities, uh, urban area, uh, the things that we have to learn. Or we can learn, we don't have to. But it can be useful skills, especially if you want to go in Tudong, uh, hiking, uh, just stay in forests, mountains. So it's good to know how to survive there. How to find water, uh, how to make drinking water, things like that. So these are the basics. But then there's also uh, about learning the Dhamma. Also helpful if you develop some skills in research. Do you know how to clarify questions for yourself? Or when maybe preparing for a Dhamma dog, you need to find some quotes from the Buddha. Huh? So how can you find those? There's so many suttas, so many passages. So how do you find them? Or if you want to clarify, what's the meaning of this word? You have to see it in different contexts. So nowadays we have digital tools for that. And uh, it's good to have some familiarity with them. Did you know how the software works? And you don't have to memorize all everything in Bali nowadays anymore. You can just key it in, and then get search results, and then uh, evaluate them. In this way, the monk over time also is meant to become more and more independent also of his teacher. Because in the end, the goal should be that you can live on your own and be fully sufficient and can clarify, can understand the Dhamma uh, by uh, your own practice or by looking things up in the texts. And for that purpose also, a basic level of Pali knowledge is also helpful. Because many of those tools do make use of Pali uh, texts. So if one knows nobody, uh, then you can't make use of these tools because all these search results will come in Pali language. So basic familiarity with the grammar of Pali uh, is also something uh, that we have courses here. And where throughout the course of the five years, first five years as a monk, a monk will learn about. Not necessarily a newly ordained monk straight away, but slowly, slowly, gradually. Yeah. So we don't have to become Bali scholars, but basic Bali, uh, I would say, is helpful and important for the monk to acquire over time. And then for those who are really interested in it, uh, they can on their own uh, go deeper in their Bali studies. Another important aspect, not only in monasteries, but I think everywhere, is right speech you know, and conversation skills beyond just being silent. <laughs> if you go on a retreat, uh, uh, right speech is fulfilled by being silent. But actually, right speech can be much broader than just being silent. It's speech that unites those who are divided, that is truthful, meaningful, uh, connected with the goal, helpful, at the right time, spoken with loving kindness. And that requires, requires practice. And there are even out in the world also good tools around. Maybe you've heard about nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg. But it's also something that one can practice. There's a system of practice, uh, certain guidelines that one can try to incorporate into one's conversations, especially when they are difficult conversations, you know. Uh, you want to admonish someone or say, point something out, uh, then it's 
helpful if you can do that skillfully. So these are all things that even in monasteries we also need. Another area is also uh, developing skills in verbal and also digital presentation of the Dhamma. And here in SBS, um, normally the newly ordained monks will not give Dhamma talks or uh, large speeches, but we can practice already in that among our monastics, they can practice giving smaller sharings of Dhamma and then they will get feedback afterwards. Uh, we analyze a little bit uh, what can be improved, both not only in the content of the Dhamma, but also the style of delivery. So to make it interesting and engaging. And then after a few years, uh, the person will also feel confident to share the Dhamma at occasions when there's an invitation, maybe for a Dhamma talk or for a retreat even, that the monk feels confident and would know how to do that, to help and give something back to society. Monks have been supported. It's good to give them time, not straight away to push monastics into becoming teachers. But then over time, it's also nice if they can give something back if they want. And many, many want actually. So it is also something that can be practiced and trained and where we give our support for that. And nowadays, Dhamma sharing happens not only uh, verbally, often also uh, you can go to a Buddhist blog or a website and answer Dhamma questions there. So this is also something, not for newly ordained monks, but then maybe Machima monks or around five Vasa, uh, they can also start uh, answering questions there and develop some skills in this area. For newly ordained monks, I think it's better to not get too much into uh, technology and internet because there can be such a strong pull and many have anyway a history of almost like internet addiction before they become monks. So it's good to give them some distance and not get them sucked in again so quickly into, into this area. But then you have for providing Dhamma talks, uh, some can provide slides, presentations, some PowerPoint to support uh, what uh, we are communicating, to support the teachings of the Buddha. That makes it easier to memorize, to understand, and also to share. Well, so there are also skills related to that. How do you make a presentation like this? Likewise with writing skills. Now some of the monastics, they are actually quite knowledgeable and they on their own can write quite nice essays about the Dhamma already. And so they are also, we can give support and train how to, how to write a paper. What should be in the introduction, what should be in the body, how to, to structure an argument. Also now there's Dhamma sharing skills on a Buddhist blog or website or chat group. Again, these are things that are often more relevant for a bit more senior monks, not for newly attained ones. But again, these are all ways of giving something back and of sharing the Dhamma, either verbally, directly, or by making use of these digital doors. So the way I look at it is that this whole aspect of training and learning this is a, it's a lifelong process. And SPS Monk Training Center is a place where not just junior monks and newly ordained monks can learn something, but where even a 5 Vasa, 10 Vasa or 20 Vasa monk can find something where he can benefit from and maybe also contribute. So it's a kind of win-win situation. So then, uh, how does a typical newly ordained monk spend his first period in monk training? And uh, it's very clear uh, to candidates who are then in SPS that actually we don't do temporary ordination. So they are meant to, somebody aspires to be a monk for a long time and to undergo training here has an expectation that for at least five years, a person is willing to commit himself, maybe not necessarily to be in SPS continuously for five years, but 
to coordinate oneself with SPS, with the teacher, and to spend probably the majority of time here. And then sometimes also I find it good if monks get experience in other monasteries, uh, especially since we are here not in a Buddhist country, I think it's also valuable to spend some time either in Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka. Uh, so typically it would be that first vasa after ordination, the first year uh, you spend in SPS, second year uh, either in Burma, Thailand, Sri Lanka, uh, one of the good monasteries that we have connection already with, where we know the practice is good, good standards of Venera, uh, then uh, I would send the monk over to that place. Then comes back again after half a year, one year, uh, for third Vasa in SPS. Number four can again be an outside year, and then the fifth Vasa back in SPS. So in this way, you spend more than half in SPS, but also you get already to see a little bit also from other editions. And for foreigners who uh, have to go on visa runs from time to time, they anyway have to go either to Thailand, Singapore, uh, from periodically uh, to re renew the visa for Malaysia. Actually, we have a second model also. It turns out that some people like it so much in SPS or in Malaysia, they don't even want to go to, like I said earlier, to Thailand, Burma, or anywhere, even in Malaysia. So then they request, and there's a second way how we can do it, is that somebody spends the first two years continuously in SPS, and then spends only one year outside, the third wasa, and four and five is back again to SPS. So in this way he gets the maximum amount of time uh, within uh, Malaysia and SPS. So this is on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, also uh, where we work together with the student uh, according to his needs and inclinations. I would also like to highlight that SPS since 2018 has become an international monk training center. And as many of you know, we have hosted quite a variety of monks from different backgrounds, from different countries. Uh, we had monks here from Australia, Austria, well, like myself, Canada, Czech Republic, Germany, uh, Myanmar, Russia, South Korea, Sri Lanka, Thailand. This was all already in the first uh, Wasser. This was already in 2019, I think. Uh, also, USA. Yeah. So, in addition to Malaysians and and Westerners. I actually also see great value uh, that monks from each of the three main Theravada countries, uh, we have them also here, uh, often on a rotation basis. So uh, one monk from Burma, one from Sri Lanka, and Thailand. And in this way, actually, the Sangha can learn from each other's different backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, Buddhist backgrounds, and Sometimes you can discover your own conditioning by exposing yourself to other uh, traditions or to other cultures. So this is helpful not only for the Westerners, but also for the Malaysians who come to train here to get each other's uh, conditioning uh, checked by living together with others who might think differently in some areas. And sometimes you discover uh, much better ways of doing things than that what we are used to. So in this way, uh, Westerners, Asians uh, can learn and support each other very beautifully. I always find it very rewarding, actually, this, to work with one's cultural conditioning and learn from each other. And I can see some typical qualities where the Westerners actually uh, I want them to learn, especially by going to Buddhist country, uh, living together among Thais, Burmese, Sri Lankans. Uh, even here in Malaysia also, uh, what they like is very much this, this trust in the teacher, the Buddha, which is, I always find, much stronger, actually, culturally speaking, uh, from 
what I find in these Buddhist countries compared to the typical little bit intellectual Westerner. Uh, also, you see Asian culture is much more emphasis on, on being a good team player, a good group player, and being adaptive to the situation. This is something that we Westerners really need to learn. <laughs> But there are also aspects where, yeah, some quality is also okay that Westerners bring to the table, which maybe some of the Asians also can pick up. Of. I noticed that some of the Westerners can be very goal oriented. They're striving quite diligently. Can sometimes be too much of, but generally speaking, yeah, they're, they're quite dedicated in their practice. And also they have a bit more of a skeptical or questioning attitude not taking everything on trust. That is also sometimes can be helpful. So in this way, the different types of conditioning uh, can you can learn from each other. And uh, I think it's very helpful and useful. And I would also like to remind everyone that SPS was originally founded in 2000 as a Malaysia nationwide project. Huh? And the idea was that for Malaysians, especially Chinese Malaysians, that you don't need to go abroad in order to become a monk. So that we, you can get actually proper monk training here that fits to your own background, your own climate that is suitable, uh, the nutrition that is suitable, rather than going to a place where many of those supporting conditions can be quite difficult, not knowing, knowing the language not knowing their culture. Uh, so I would also like to renew also that invitation, you know, that old vision of SPS to be a place where Malaysians ordain and train. And I'm very happy currently we have here three Malaysian postulants, uh, altogether four, one Westerners, three Malaysians who are looking forward to train and ordain in, in SPS the upcoming period. And yeah, it's good to see the Sangha growing, both the Westerners, also locals, and practicing together in harmony. I have also noticed that many places in Malaysia, we have wonderful monasteries already, quite a number. But the facilities for uh, monk training, actually you need some things like a good library, uh, some tools, uh, some electronic equipment can be helpful. Uh, then you need somebody who is very dedicated to monk training, who is organizing courses, workshops, uh, somebody to, to teach a little bit of Bali, uh, pronunciation, and so many things. So actually not every place will be able to cater to all these different important aspects. And this is where I think SPS can play a small role in that, and it's already happening, that monks or abbots can send the ordination candidate over also to SPS, and then for a certain period uh, gets training here, and then goes back again to his native monastery where he came from. And then again after maybe half a year, comes back again to again get a uh, refresh a dose, like a second vaccine, you get your second shot. So in this way, there can be a back and forth over the first period of the five years, the typical training period, where a person can undergo the training, both in his place where he originally comes from, but also with the support of SPS, not only the infrastructure, but also the community, where there are people here, to, you can ask questions, we have some experts on Bali, others on Vinaya, on Dhamma, Abhidhamma, uh, Suttas, early Buddhism. Uh, so it's difficult to find this combination, I think. And even though sometimes also our facilities here are becoming quite full, the first preference will always be for locals. How would one anyway know whether one is suitable or suited for the nation? It's actually not so easy to know, you know. Because from outside, you don't quite know how monks left will be. One way is 
we allow lay people, uh, males usually, for if they want to become monks, they can come and join the community for a while and participate in the monastic activities. Uh, basically, they're doing everything together with the monks. So all of them, from starting in the morning, for group meditation, uh, chanting, chores, sweeping. They even follow along on arms round, and so on. Together, of course, also with sutta class, when they are classes. So in this way, uh, they're getting an insider's perspective of how monk's life really is, rather than just having maybe an imagination from the suttas or from, from stories that one has heard. But it's always difficult to imagine. So we allow yogis to practice together with us, and that is meant for them to get an understanding whether this is really something that could be suitable for them. And then, if they like, uh, then there could be a chance for later for ordination. Or, if it turns out, you know, it's not your thing really, uh, then, okay, then also you know, at least, okay, uh, maybe that's not the lifestyle I can do or I wish to do for the time being. So, let us return to the original question. Are monastics protecting or corrupting the sasana? Short answer, yes. Both, it depends. Huh? Well, a long answer could be that a monastic who strives for the goal of liberation with the fullest of his energy and who maintains a heart of loving kindness and compassion for all living beings and the welfare of others, including the supporting community, and who inspires his co-monastics to practice, and also the laity, likewise, to practice and who functions as a living reminder for the possibility to strive for the goal and to dedicate one's life for the highest goal, for Nibbana. Yes, such a monastic, I would say, indeed, protects this asana. So, I wish for all of us that the number of such monastics uh, continues to increase and so that the Buddhist teachings will remain accessible and flourish for a long time. And it was a totally enjoyable evening also for me uh, because it is a thing that is very dear to my heart, monk coordination, monastic training, and how can we have good monks who can also then be inspiring, uh, the inspiring not just teachers and leaders, but also good practitioners for themselves. But then out of these practitioners, we will get, hopefully, also a whole generation of monks who are very capable in sharing the Dharma, being inspiring, uh, giving guidance, and also give something back to our Malaysian society, to our Buddhist societies, and also, uh, more generally speaking, to anyone uh, that, he that he meets and encounters. So in that sense, I hope, hope that the efforts that we are undertaking here in SPS Monk Training Center will also be and are already a support to the sasana and also the flourishing and well-being of the Buddhist teachings. <laughs>